America, Florida, Miami International Airport, May 11, 1996, 11.30 a.m. 24-year-old Jay Smith is being dropped off by his good friend Scott Plyman. Jay is on his way home to Montgomery, Alabama. Don't forget to say hi to your parents, okay? Tomorrow is Mother's Day and his whole family are looking forward to seeing him, especially his mother Susan, who dotes on him. He is a wonderful child. I could not have asked for a better son. He is perfect in every way. Jay checks the board for his flight, value jet 592, due to leave at one o'clock. He's there in plenty of time because security is especially tight at the moment. The 26th Olympic Games start soon in Atlanta, and already the FBI have arrested right-wing militants and discovered hordes of bomb-making equipment. Islamic terrorist Ramzi Youssef is also in the headlines. He's accused of trying to blow up the World Trade Center. The FBI believes that members of his gang could still be at large and ready to strike. Airliners are thought to be a prime target. Booked on the same flight as Jay Smith, a Sue and Ron Carpenter. They got married just three days ago on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. Sue's brother, Mike, is delighted for them. She was never happier in her life, and I don't think Ron was either. They had common interests, enjoyed being together. They, they were such a good match. Also traveling to Atlanta, there are several children. Among them, Andrew Leonard, his brother Jeremy, and sister Tabitha. She turns 13 a week today. In total, 105 passengers are about to board the aircraft. It's a Douglas DC 932. A twin engine jet with a distinctive T-tail stabilizer at the rear. The DC-9 has been in service for over three decades and was once a mainstay of American domestic aviation. But its history is not without incident. Since 1966, 77 DC-9s have been lost with more than 1,800 fatalities. Now 27 years old, this particular plane has clocked up over 68,000 hours in the air and is currently owned by the budget airline, ValueJet. 1.25 p.m. Flight attendant Mandy Summers welcomes the passengers aboard. Her bubbly personality has earned her the nickname Mrs. ValueJet. She's only had the job for a few months, but she's hoping for promotion soon. She just knew it wasn't really where she wanted to be in her life. I guess she envisioned it as something more than it really was when she actually started. At the gate, ramp agents load the DC-9's Ford cargo hold with passenger baggage, 23 kilos of US mail, and some aircraft parts, three tires, and several cardboard boxes labeled COMAT, short for company material. In the cockpit this afternoon is Captain Candelin Kubek. All right, Richard, how about a before start checklist? She has 2,000 hours flying time on DC 9s. And within Value Jet, she's famous for her dedication to the job. She couldn't get it out of her blood. She was destined to fly and um, just wasn't happy any other way. Surprise! The day before, Candy celebrated her 35th birthday. Her crew threw her a surprise party on board the plane at Dallas and wanted her to go line dancing. But typically, she refused. 
she said, they know, knew better that I will never go out the night before a uh, uh, flight. 1.30 p.m. And the aircraft is 30 minutes behind schedule. There have been some minor mechanical problems. The jet's autopilot isn't working properly. A fuel gauge and cabin phone are out. And there's been a fault in the hydraulics backup circuit. Checking through the systems is First Officer Richard Hazen. He's an Air Force veteran with 20 years of aviation experience behind him. Faulty equipment is not an unusual state of affairs at Value Jet. The carrier sells low-cost airfares using old planes bought from around the world. Its fleet is among the oldest in America, averaging 26 years. And there have been recent incidents. Just under a year ago, an engine exploded on another DC-9 while it was on the runway at Atlanta. Seven people were injured by flying debris, and the Federal Aviation Administration has the carrier under investigation. 1.32 p.m. Opa Locker Airfield, 16 kilometers from Miami International. Daniel Mulho and his friend Rick Delisle get ready for a pleasure flight in Daniel's Piper Arrow light aircraft. 1.41. Mechanics can't fix the autopilot before the flight, so the flight crew disengages. The other faults are not serious, and the plane is ready to go. Captain Kubek and First Officer Hazen go through their final pre-flight checks, preparing for takeoff. 1.44 p.m. After 44 minutes delay, ground control finally clears flight 592, call sign Critter, for takeoff. Now the flight crew begin to taxi the 48-ton plane towards the runway and wait for their takeoff slot. 203. 63 minutes after the scheduled departure time, the DC-9 begins to accelerate down the runway. And Captain Kubek gently eases its nose upwards. At last, Flight 592 is on its way. Lead flight attendant Jennifer Stearns makes the customary reassuring announcement to passengers. Captain Kubek puts the plane into a climb, heading for its cruising altitude of 10,500 meters. Jay Smith and his fellow passengers sit back, relax, and prepare for the 92-minute flight to Atlanta. But at 2.10 p.m., just minutes after takeoff, people start to smell smoke. Flight attendant Mandy Summers attempts to reassure the passengers. <coughs> but the temperature is rising and the smoke is getting thicker by the second. Value Jet Flight 592, with the Carpenters, Jay Smith, and 107 other passengers and crew aboard, is in serious trouble. 2.11 p.m., the situation is getting worse on board the DC-9 bound for Atlanta. Smoke is rising from the cabin floor, and it's getting thicker. At the same time, there's a problem in the cockpit. The pilots hear a loud bang on their headphones. What was that? I don't know. They know there's a problem with the plane's electrics because the battery charger has activated, trying to restore power. Everything. Then smoke starts to seep into the cockpit. Critter 592, we need a V to return to Miami International. Turn left, heading 270. Zero. Descend and maintain 7,000. What kind of problem are you having? It's clear something is badly wrong. Smoke in the cabin. <laughs> Three kilometers away, Daniel Mulhocht is at the controls of his light aircraft. He sees a large jet making a turn. We're flying along, and around my 10 o'clock position, I saw an aircraft maneuvering along the canal. 
to 11 and 30 seconds. On board the DC-9, Kubek struggles with the aircraft. It seems as if the controls are no longer responding normally. In the cabin, the temperature is rising. Flight attendant Jennifer Stearns bursts into the cockpit. She's desperate to know why the pilots have not lowered the passenger's oxygen masks. We need oxygen. We can't get oxygen back there. Jen, we can't do it. Can't take the masks. The pilots refuse. They realize they're not going to make it back to Miami and desperately ask for the nearest airport instead. We need vectors to an immediate. And the critter fight on the nearest runway. From his position in the light aircraft, it's obvious to Daniel Mulhobt there's a crisis unfolding before his eyes. This guy is out of control. 2.13 p.m. On the canal below, Chris Osceola is out fishing with his uncle Sam Nelson when he sees the DC-9. Hey Sam, look at this plane. The aircraft swoops just a few hundred meters over the two fishermen. I don't see flames, I don't see smoke, the landing gear's up. He's doing some odd maneuvers out here. 2.13 and 34 seconds. On board the stricken plane, the passengers and crew have passed out. 2.13 and 42 seconds. Just 9 minutes and 27 seconds after takeoff. Flight 592 crashes into the Florida Everglades. These photos, taken from the light aircraft just seconds after impact, show only a dark pool of fuel on the surface of the swamp. From his plane, Daniel Mulhobt radios ground control at Miami and tells them he's just seen a plane crash. He stays above the site to help the emergency services locate the spot. Fisherman Chris Osceola also takes a photo. When the two men climb to the top of a levee, everything is eerily quiet. The swamp has simply absorbed the 48-ton aircraft. And not to see anything at all or hear anything, I mean, it was just, you hear birds chirping, you, you know, but you could smell the jet fuel. The crash site is 270 meters away from the nearest levee and 14 kilometers from the nearest road. Rescuers can only reach it by airboat and helicopter. They're confronted by a horrifying scene. Sergeant Felix Jimenez from the Miami-Dade Police is one of the first to arrive. As we got closer to the crash site, uh, I could determine that th there was an aircraft that crashed, but it was all in very small pieces. Good evening. Well, if you've been with us through the afternoon, you know that there has been a terrible air crash just northwest of Miami International Airport, a value jet DC-9 with 109 passengers and crew bound for Atlanta, went down in the Everglades at mid-afternoon. As the networks get hold of the story, searches continue to look for survivors until the light fails. It's a hopeless task. We have not so far been able to find any victims, any survivors, any bodies. Within hours, the dreadful news begins to reach the relatives. Susan Smith discovers the terrible truth about her beloved son in a phone call. There was horrible screaming, and I realized that it was my daughter. She told me that a plane had gone down coming from Miami. And at the moment she told me that, in my heart I knew that it was the plane that Jay was on. Jay Smith, on his way home for Mother's Day, has had his life cut short before it could really begin. At her home near Atlanta, Georgia, Captain Kubek's mother, Marilyn, also gets the dreadful call. I really threw myself on the floor and beat the floor and in despair. This just can't be true. It's, it, it, I'm, I'm having a dream, a nightmare. This is not real. Just one of the children to die, Tabitha Leonard is killed just a week before her 13th birthday. 
With despair come demands for an explanation. Why did Flight 592 plummet from the sky just minutes after takeoff? Why were two such experienced pilots unable to save the plane? Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day and going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened to Value Jet Flight 592. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. One thousand five hundred kilometers to the north, in Washington, D.C., National Transportation Safety Board expert Greg Fife watches the news from Miami. He's led two major investigations for the safety board before, but he already knows this one will be a uniquely difficult challenge. As I was running around my house packing to leave and having all the TVs on and they were showing aerial views of the accident site, all I could wonder as an accident investigator is how am I going to conduct this investigation when I don't see any visible wreckage. As Greg assembles the safety board's rapid response team, an NTSB official captures the scene with a home video camera. Just two hours after the loss of Flight 592, they're en route to Miami and fly over the crash site on the way. It's a sobering sight. Definitely not a lot of anything out here. With over 800 DC-9s in service, finding out just what happened is a matter of urgency. But with a crash site like this, Greg knows you'll have to build up a picture of what happened piece by painstaking piece. All the information that you get, all the evidence that you develop is equal until such time is that the storyline, the facts support a particular storyline. The hole in the swamp is 40 meters long and 12 meters wide. Wearing special biohazard suits to protect them from spilt aviation fuel, searchers walk shoulder to shoulder, combing the murky water. But the swamp proves almost impossible to penetrate. Beneath the water lies a thick layer of matted vegetation. Sawgrass cuts and tangles the searchers as they try to move forward. What is your full name, please? Jesse Lowell Fisher. And your occupation? As the search for clues gets underway, safety board experts make it a priority to interview the last person who spoke to Flight 592. Air traffic controller, Jesse Fisher. They discovered that the crew had reported smoke on board minutes before the crash. Smoke suggests one thing loud and clear, a fire somewhere on the plane. So the focus now becomes what's the origin of the fire that would create enough smoke for the crew to not only notice it, but have to report it. One answer could lie in Value Jet's all too recent history. Could this be a repeat of the 1995 incident? Could some kind of engine failure have led, even indirectly, to the loss of a second aircraft within a year? It's a frightening prospect. Value Jet alone have 47 other DC-9s in their fleet. Could they all have faulty engines? Perhaps thousands more passengers are at risk. Conditions at the site where Value Jet 592 crashed are hazardous. There's a constant threat from alligators, attracted by the search activity, the wreck, and its contents. Armed guards are deployed to keep the predators away. To make matters worse, the airboats and search teams are stirring up the silt layer, reducing visibility below the water from just a few centimeters to zero. Then, in an attempt to see through the murky water, the team brings in ground-penetrating radar. They make a depressing discovery. Below the water level is a thick layer of mud, and below that, two meters down, is solid limestone. The plane has smashed into thousands of pieces as it hit the rock below. The 
team starts to piece together all the recovered debris at nearby Kendall Tamiami Airport, where safety board specialists will examine it closely. But early analysis of the engine wreckage offers little hope of an easy answer. Plain debris, sawgrass and swamp mud have become buried deep in the engine casings. Craig Fife knows that this is only likely to happen if they were working normally on impact. While he can't rule out some sort of engine malfunction, it's looking less likely as the cause of the crash. Solving the mystery will require all the experience the NTSB have to offer. So senior board members like John Golia, a DC-9 expert, are drafted in. Even for him, the huge loss of life is hard to accept. You still feel the pressure uh, on your emotions knowing that 110 people have died right in this area where you're working, where you're recovering pieces. And uh, it, it does eat on you. For all the investigators, the search for clues is a grim task. Every time I went out to the accident site, knowing that there were a lot of children on this flight, and you see the remnants, it was, a, it was very emotionally, it's, it's very heart-tugging. It was very, very difficult every single day. Gradually, the relatives and public learn the full horror of the tragedy. When you go through something like this, you would give anything to have those people back in your life. I can remember seeing those images of the crash and it tore me apart. I tried not to cry in front of my mother. I would go in the shower at night and just sob. Slowly, sections of the DC-9 begin to take shape on the floor of a hangar. The investigators painstakingly recover, decontaminate, and identify thousands of pieces. There are two parts that would help the investigation more than any other. The flight data and cockpit voice recorders. But the black boxes, as they're often called, remain stubbornly hidden in the swamp. Without them, it would have made the investigative process very difficult because they were going to provide us with a lot of information. The team carry on regardless and find that even without the black boxes, the wreckage in the hangar does begin to yield useful information. Metal seat frames have melted. Carpets and fuselage coverings have burned intensely. It becomes clear that the smoke that First Officer Hazen reported has indeed come from a devastating fire. One hot enough to melt aluminium. They estimate temperatures in the cabin area must have reached at least 815 degrees Celsius. But even for DC-9 expert John Golia, the source of such an inferno is a mystery. We knew that there was an intense fire. What that meant, how that happened, was eluding us. Then, as one of the police teams fans out across the muddy pools of swamp water, an officer steps on something solid. A moment captured on camera. It's the FDR, or flight data recorder, a major find. I'm there, we got a box. If the box survived the crash intact, it'll provide the team with key technical data from the flight, including airspeed, altitude, and the plane's movements in the air. Crucially, it'll tell them whether the plane's engines failed. But when technicians and officials at NTSB headquarters in Washington get their first look at the flight data recorder, they're not optimistic. This flight data recorder took a severe hit, and when we first saw it in the laboratory, uh, we had great concern that we were not going to get the data off of it. While they wait, the NTSB team consider a new, sinister option. The fire was so sudden and the loss of control so complete that a bomb has to be a possibility. Will the United States have to tell the world that terrorists are active in the southern states? Greg Fife must find the secrets to the crash of Flight 592. What could have happened to an ordinary DC-9 on a routine flight to Atlanta? Might this vast swamp be the scene of a crime?
One of the things that we need to identify is whether this is a pure accident or an intentional act. If it's an intentional act, that means it's criminal. Islamic extremist Ramzi Youssef is awaiting trial for the first bombing of the World Trade Center and plotting to blow up American planes. But although Youssef is no longer at large, other terrorist cells continue to present a threat. In this period of time, we also had a new element to be concerned with, and that was uh, the continual intelligence briefings that we had been receiving about uh, threats to aviation in the United States. Robert Starr, leader of a group calling itself the Militia at Large of the Republic of Georgia, was arrested two weeks ago. Seized as part of the operation were dozens of pipe bomb components. With the Olympics so close, a major airline bombing would be just the type of attack needed to spread fear and anxiety at the games. Working closely with FBI agents at the scene, investigators send samples of debris from the crash crater to an FBI lab. There, they'll be analyzed for traces of explosives. It's a tense time for the investigators, but then comes a major step forward. After hours of delicate work, the NTSB's analysts have managed to extract the data from the damaged flight data recorder. The evidence is stark. The aircraft seems to have been suffering multiple mechanical and electrical failures for over two minutes. Even the FDR itself seems to have failed about 55 seconds before impact. But the safety board can now finally rule out engine failure as the cause of the disaster. The performance data on the FDR showed us that the engines were running. So far, they know there was a fast burning and very hot fire, and that the engines seem to have been functioning on impact. But they have little else to go on. There are still many mysteries about Flight 592. If only they can find a second black box, the vitally important cockpit voice recorder, they might find the missing clues they so desperately need. The flight data recorder won't tell us what was actually happening in the airplane. The cockpit voice recorder could give us a clue as to what the origin of the fire was because the crew would have been talking about the things that were taking place. As the salvage teams continue to search the swamp, the investigators look for clues elsewhere. They know that Value Jet is under investigation over its poor safety and maintenance record. There were problems with this Value Jet operation virtually every week before the accident. There was a real concern that was Value Jet shorting on maintenance. Were they doing things in the interest of money rather than safety? That was a very big concern throughout the process of this accident investigation. Greg and his team examine the plane's recent fault history. Can they find the answer to the crash here? Sure enough, they discover the DC-9 did have several problems prior to takeoff and that the plane had been delayed as a result. They find that the plane's autopilot had been malfunctioning for two days. The pilot's log states that when engaged, it made the plane pitch up and down. Mechanics try to repair it, but failed. So 592's crew followed standard procedure and flew in manual mode instead. The team also discovered that the fuse for the hydraulic backup system blew, but this time mechanics did manage to repair it. Although it seemed a promising lead, they can find nothing in the maintenance log that explains the crash. It was clear that singly or collectively, none of those would have caused a fire on the airplane. Then, the results come back from the FBI lab, and the investigators, the organizers of the Olympic Games, even the federal government, can breathe a sigh of relief. This was not an incendiary type device or an explosive type device. That put the fear in, uh, aside for us as investigators that we were gonna be looking at it from a different perspective. They can now rule out a terrorist attack as the cause of the crash.
But Feith is still no nearer to solving the mystery. Finding the cockpit voice recorder, or CVR, is still their best hope in the search for the cause of the disaster. By Sunday, May the 26th, the search has been going on for more than two tough, frustrating weeks. Today, the search party is one man short. So Sergeant Jimenez, the policeman who'd been one of the first on the scene after the crash, volunteers to go back into the swamp. The search was very difficult. It's 80 and 90 degree weather, high humidity. Almost every day we had thunderstorms and we had to evacuate the crash site. Finally comes the break everyone has been hoping for. I said a very short prayer and as soon as we resumed the search, I stuck my probe in the water and I knew I had hit metal. I reached down, followed the probe and pulled out the CVR. It's not just the policeman's prayer that's answered. It's also a major turning point for the team. The voice recording gives the investigators a chilling insight into the last moments of the crew. First, they discover that Captain Kubek and her co-pilot Richard Hazen knew they had a problem at 2.10 p.m., six minutes into the flight, when they heard a strange noise on their headphones. What was that? I don't know. We got some kind of electrical problem. Then the plane's battery charger kicks into life. Battery charger's kicking in. We're losing everything. It's another clue. The battery charger would start if there was a loss of electrical power. Could an electrical fault have caused the fire? After all, the DC-9 was 27 years old and carried kilometers of cabling. A faulty wire in or near the passenger cabin might have caused a spark and started the blaze. It's a long shot because pinpointing such a short circuit is extremely difficult. But spurred on by the cockpit conversations and the FDR record, Greg tells the investigators to probe the remains of the wiring and the circuit breakers. Much of the wiring has been badly damaged or completely destroyed. The rest is in bits on the hangar floor. But for the team, there could still be clues to be had. Because it's broken in ten places, that doesn't mean it's not going to tell you a story. Every one of those pieces, when you decide to look at them, has a story to tell. But try as they might, they can't find any evidence for a short circuit. It's another dead end. Once more, they return to the cockpit voice recorder. We need oxygen. We can't get oxygen back there. Nearly three minutes before the crash, flight attendant Jennifer Stearns opens the cockpit door. It's clear that the passengers in the cabin are the first to be overcome by smoke. To Fife, this places the fire somewhere behind the pilots. The investigators at Kendall Tamiami concentrate on the area around the jet's passenger cabin. What they discover is shocking. The fire was so intense here that the floor has literally melted away. Could something beneath the passengers' feet possibly in the forward cargo hold, have started the fire. It's an unlikely scenario. This compartment is officially known as a Class D hold. Completely airtight, it also has a fireproof lining. Any blaze here should quickly burn itself out through lack of oxygen. But Fife decides to check it out anyhow. We had to go back to the manifest. We had to see what was in that forward cargo hold. The safety board studies the paperwork to see if the forward hold contained anything suspicious. It indicates that in the hold were 28 kilos of mail and some passenger baggage. But with a bomb or incendiary device already ruled out, investigators move on. The manifest also shows two consignments of aircraft parts in the compartment. Instantly, they see something suspicious three tires from another DC-9. For transportation, tires should be filled with nitrogen and underinflated or they can burst. An oversight here could possibly be the cause of the disaster, but the records show that the ground crew followed correct procedure. Another promising lead has gone nowhere.
The shipping ticket also lists five cardboard boxes full of parts labeled oxygen canisters loaded in the hold. At first, Greg and his team have no concerns. They think they're empty steel oxygen cylinders as fitted to many different kinds of plane. But then, the whole investigation takes a dramatic turn. These are not simply oxygen cylinders. In fact, they're chemical oxygen generators. Small metal canisters containing a volatile and potentially hazardous mix of compounds. Investigators are horrified. That changed the whole complexity and complexion of the investigation. When installed, the generators supply oxygen for passengers in an emergency. They're attached to a face mask with a thin rope that connects to a firing pin. If passengers pull down on the masks, the pin is released, starting a chemical reaction which produces oxygen. During use, the generator surface temperature can reach 260 degrees Celsius. Could the spare generators housed in the hold have somehow activated and burst into flames? There's just one problem with this theory. The shipping ticket lists all the generators as empty. So they couldn't have been hazardous. Or could they? Investigators interview staff from ValueJet's maintenance company, Sabertech, based in Miami. They discover that the generators in the boxes on board Flight 592 had been removed from two McDonnell Douglas MD-82 jets because they were out of date. The rules for disposal are clear. They should either be activated and disposed of properly or made safe by fitting small safety caps over the firing mechanism. Sabertech produces work cards confirming that the generators were properly dealt with. But then comes a remarkable discovery. Salvage teams recover 28 of the generators from the swamp, 18 almost intact. Greg and his team examine them carefully. To their amazement, they discover that 9 of the 28 show signs of activation. At least some of the oxygen generators could not have been empty as the shipping ticket said. When they question the Sabertech workers further, they admit that they did not fit any safety caps on the canisters. They just duct taped the cords round the metal canisters or cut them and stuck the ends down with tape. Then they signed off the work cards even though the correct procedure hadn't been followed. Finally, a stock clerk packed them loosely under a layer of bubble wrap. I couldn't understand how the process could break down so substantially and the carelessness that originated on the shop floor could escalate to getting these oxygen generators on the airplane. But so far, it's only a theory. Greg and the team don't know for sure whether an activated generator could produce enough heat to start a fire. At this point in time, nobody really had a good understanding of what happens when these uh, oxygen generators start producing oxygen. The NTSB embark on a critical experiment. They construct a replica hold at the Federal Aviation Authority's fire test facility near Atlantic City. Technicians place 28 generators in a box and cover them in bubble wrap. They pull a wire connected to the pin of one generator and retreat. They have high hopes, but the generator heat produces just a small fire and a little smoke. None of the other generators activates and the box doesn't catch a light. Greg's theory doesn't seem to be standing up. That first test was discouraging you tend to start to question, are we really going down the right road? With the public, the airline industry, and friends and families of 110 people pressing for answers, the NTSB are facing a crisis. 
The mystery of what downed ValueJet 592 is proving a tough nut to crack. Early results from the fire test facility suggest that the chemical oxygen generators simply don't create enough heat to start a fire. Greg and the team have to try again. They have no alternative. They repeat the test, but this time they copy the conditions in the hold more accurately. They use more generators, baggage, and an airplane tire. This time, the fire takes hold in just a few minutes. After 10 minutes, the roof of the test hold is at 1,100 degrees Celsius. A minute later, it's climbed another 430 degrees. 30 seconds more, and the temperature is too high to be measured accurately by the lab equipment. Then, after 16 minutes, comes a noise that provides the last clue. The tire in the recreation of the hold has burst. The oxygen generators did have the capacity to start and sustain a fire. You have 144 little blow torches, in essence, and the intensity of the heat escalated from what we found in post-accident testing to over 3,000 degrees. Investigators now know the critical chain of events that led to the crash of Flight 592. They know why a fire started on board the plane, what fueled it, and why the pilots lost control of the aircraft, leaving everyone on board seconds from disaster. May 11th, 1996. One hour to disaster. A Sabertech driver pulls up at gate G2 at Miami International Airport with value jet cargo for flight 592. Inside the boxes are 144 out-of-date oxygen generators, loosely packed. A ramp agent places them around a large airplane tire. The pilots are unaware that they have a dangerous load on board. 30 minutes to go. As the plane taxis to the runway, the loose packing and unsecured cargo jolts one of the generators into action. It begins to heat up. 11 minutes to disaster. The plane taxis to its takeoff position. In the hold, the surface of the metal generator gets hotter and hotter. Soon, the heat ignites the cardboard box and bubble wrap, and the blaze begins. Ten minutes to disaster. Flight 592 takes off from Miami Airport. Even though the hold is airtight, the fire is now blazing fiercely, sustained by the oxygen produced by the generator. Three and a half minutes to go. The sound heard by the crew is one of the tires in the hold bursting, just as it did in the lab test. Oh, the battery charge is kicking in. We're losing everything. The battery charger can't help the stricken jet, as the fire is consuming everything in its path, including the control cables that run to the rear of the plane. Captain Kubek begins to lose control of the aircraft. Temperatures in the hold have now reached more than 1,650 degrees Celsius. In the cabin, passengers are becoming desperate as they choke on the toxic fumes. We need oxygen. We can't get oxygen out of there. Flight attendant Jennifer Stearns rushes into the cockpit. But the pilots refuse to drop the masks, knowing that oxygen would only make the fire worse. One minute from disaster. The cabin floor burns and begins to give way. Seven seconds to disaster. Now no one is in control of the plane. The crew are probably unconscious, overcome by toxic fumes given off by the aircraft's interior physics. Seconds later, Flight 592 nosedives into the Florida Everglades at 800 kilometers an hour. Nearly three months after the crash, 
relatives hold a mass funeral for 48 of the victims, whose remains are interred together. ValueJet eventually takes over another company and becomes Air Tran. Sabertech is fined $500,000 for its part in the tragedy, but goes out of business before the money is ever paid. Since 2001, fire detection and suppression systems have become mandatory. In the United States, it takes a dramatic event to move the regulatory authorities to change. And in this case, it took the loss of 110 people. 